Uh, hey, what's up, everyone? You're currently tuned into TBD on KCSB FM 91.9 in Santa Barbara and at netradio.com. Tijuana, Today Live Talk, and I are joined by Boston label head and rocker Aiden from Candlepin Records and Slowcore Band Husbands. Candlepin has only been around for a couple years at this point, I would say, at this point, uh, but have quickly become a staple in the DIY uh, rock tape label along with like Smoking Room and Julia's War. How you doing, Aiden? I'm doing good. How are you guys? Doing Fantastic, well, man. man. Thanks for uh, <laughs> thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. This is this is awesome. So, uh, yeah, w- what have you been up to recently? Like, um, anything new going on at the moment? How's like I life going outside of music? Any hobbies? Favorite coffee shops? Favorite record stores you've been frequenting? Oh boy. Uh, let's see here. I mean, I feel like. To, to answer the last question while it's, you know, fresh in my mind, um, I feel like these days and for the last couple of years, I've just been buying everything I can from the internet. Um, just because like, there's so many great contemporary yeah. bands and like, I can easily go down. It doesn't have to be a band camp Friday. I can easily go down the band camp rabbit hole and like walk out, like buying like five things at the end of any given day. So, oh yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> you know, I feel like, you know, a lot of people, you know, kind of look to current bands, um, to like really influence what they're listening to. Uh-huh. Um, but in terms of everything else, I mean, I am good. Um, we have been, it's kind of a running joke. We, we've been waiting for things to slow down a little bit with candle pen. Um, <laughs> and they don't seem to, which is obviously a great problem to have. And, um, you know, we're, we're trying to work with as many cool bands as possible. Um, but we have, we have a lot of stuff, um, basically slated for the, uh, for the pipeline for, you know, the a big bulk of this year. Um, and I'm really excited about a lot of these releases. Um, you know, especially if you get the, like, the occasional release where you get to, to work with the artist a little bit in terms of like what they had in mind for the packaging mm-hmm. or, you know, like our album artwork or anything like that, or like how to best put pitch, like, you know, anything like promotional, like that stuff is always really interesting for me. Um, I can't speak for everybody on the team, but mm-hmm. like that stuff for me, um, is kind of what I, I get out of it myself. So like a lot of that is, is really cool to see and kind of like make that happen. But yeah, we have a lot of releases. Um, I, I was telling uh, collective fear who's on the label. Um, me and him are really good friends. So I, I'll talk to him sometimes about like the people like submitting stuff. And I was just like, dude, we have like multiple albums that I would say could end up on any given like album of the year list. You know, yeah. if people are listening closely enough, uh-huh. I think a label this size, it's probably easy to miss a release you know unless you're like tuning into every single one but uh, we have a lot of stuff coming out that i'm very very excited for a general audience to hear yeah, i love to hear that dude Go. something i noticed again in the past couple months because i know get alternative they've been buzzing about you and then had stereo gum hit you guys up in any capacity or was it just I, get alternative I, I believe I believe the alternative is is kind of one of the bigger ones that have highlighted us so mm-hmm. far. I mean, we we had the Bandcamp feature. That was obviously that was I think oh, yeah. I think everyone else reached out to me about that. Th- it was a much bigger deal than I thought it was. I mean, then all of a sudden, like my phone started blowing up that day. So it, I was happy that a lot of people saw that article. Um, but um, yeah, so it's it's one of those things where um, you know I think everyone wants. Ideally, like if they're working in music right now, they want something covered by Stereo Gum. Uh-huh. Obviously, that's kind of one of those websites where, you know, I think we're almost there. We're not quite there yet. I think maybe like there was a single or something that Stereo Gum reviewed. And, um, you know, I, otherwise, like most of the other stuff I've sent to them, they completely ignored or, you know, I'm sure they just didn't have the time. But um, but yeah, Zach um, in particular from uh, The Alternative has been super supportive of the label. Um, just like one of those people who like, you know, it, like at this point, like I feel like I barely even really have to do like the outreach with some of these people just to like get coverage, which is really nice to see too, because it means that they're paying attention and you uh-huh. know it seems important to X amount of people out there. You know, yeah, they're reviewing it, and you know that's their living. Stereo Gum, like, has mentioned bands that you're like associated with, like with the Julia's War Comp and stuff. Like, they've definitely mentioned like Feeble Little Horse and like Two uh, Full Body Two. Um, Very cool. yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't know. People probably know who you are if they're listening to those bands, you know what I mean? Um, of course. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, Anyways. on that note, um, I have talked to Julia's war a little bit, um, and it's very, very early, but 
I believe we are going to try to do another uh, joint comp at some point in the future. That's so um, sick. I, yeah, I can't say how soon in the future because I think we're both kind of working through, you know, a lot of stuff with our mm-hmm. respective labels. And I mean, Doug is insane doing like the the Julia's War Fest and having it be like five days. But I yeah. wish I could be there this year. I was there last year and Dude, it was amazing. That so. fest looks insane. Um, yeah, it's, I'm really jealous. I can't be there, honestly. Yeah, I like literally every band that I like is like playing that fest. Um, Dang. Yeah, it's crazy. And then on top of that, Doug just like handling Tagabo stuff, like being in yeah. a huge band and then also like still being able to handle a DIY tape label, you know, it's like pretty crazy. Um, yeah. Anyways, though, uh, so I guess we can talk a little bit more about like you, but um, everyone's background in DIY is like a little different. I guess like what guided you into DIY, like when you're first getting involved and like what stuff thrilled you most before you jumped into like the, the shoegaze, like slow core realm, like bring it back to like when you first started getting into music and stuff. Okay. Oh, that could, that's, that's definitely a subject I could get pretty deep into. Um, so my, um, try to like make it speedier. Um, my whole thing when I was a little kid, my mom always had music around and, you know, I think a lot of people have like very like formative influences like that. Um, but my mom did uh, PR and she did like a bunch of other stuff and like outreach and promotion and everything for Warner brothers. Um, wow. The, yeah. The late, late eighties, early nineties, um, up until like the mid nineties, I think she did that for like five or six years. Um, and so as a result, um, you know, like whole sections of her house are just like, like she has like all of these like promo copies of like, you know, vinyls and and tapes and, and, and records and everything and, and CDs that are just like, that's like what I like dug around and, mm-hmm. you know, like started like listening to when I was a little kid, you know, like, yeah. like wait for her to like leave and go to work. And like, I would just like start like ripping through her CDs and storage <laughs> and like putting them on and like seeing what they sounded like. So yeah. Was in in that was again was she doing stuff for just like all of the labels kind of under the Warner Brothers Empire at that point like uh, Electra or Atlantic or Sire? Oh, I mean all of them. Like yeah, I mean like when Sire was like really popping off and they started doing you know they started being like the U.S. imprint for like all of like the like original wave shoegaze stuff. I mean she yeah, she yeah. plays it. She got like promo copies of that stuff. Dude, so that's she got so she crazy. probably had like a promo copy of Ride with the for, for sure. That's how I got that's into them. So <laughs> you know, like Damn, um, I think insane. it was a CD copy actually, but yeah, it, there Dude. was a promo copy of Ride. Like a promo copy of like Selected Ambient Works by chance. That might be a little bit too left field <laughs> for, uh, for my mom, but <laughs> um, I would love that. That would be a great album to have on tape. Yeah. Wow. That's um that's wild to think that you're so you just came out of even like kind of instilled in that world almost. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was so, I mean that, and I mean, going back to what I was saying about, you know, your family kind of forming your, all your stuff in music. Uh Uh, My grandfather was always performing, you know, like covers and like standards and stuff, Uh Uh, but he made it like a, like a lot of good, like side money doing that. And, you know, he he had an old bass that I like started like messing around on when mm-hmm. I was probably like 12 or 13. Um, and, you know, just like got me into like a lot of like, you know, like really good standard, like old timey music and like old jazz and stuff like that. And, um, and then my grandmother, you know, no real musical training, but she was always walking around that house singing all the time. Yeah. That's just how she yeah. is. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think when you're like living around that stuff, it really definitely like makes an influence on you. Um, but yeah, then, so, so I was doing that. Um, as a little kid, were you started? Were you getting like oh, brought to shows at all? Like, were they like taking you to like gigs for any of like the bands that they're seeing or like any of like the stuff they're performing? So I actually did. I I I I got to be basically backstage for a Bowie concert in 1997. This would have been wow when he was doing the Earthling tour, which is actually like one of my favorite albums. And yeah. very that's, the, that's the drum and bass one, right? Yeah, it's yeah. definitely it's 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 you know. <laughs> It's a sleeper on some people, but yeah. I, I have a very soft spot in my heart, probably because, you know, I was exposed to that album at such a young age. I was like seven years old, just yeah. like Absolutely. getting yeah. to be backstage at a, at a fucking Bowie show. I mean, like, <laughs> that's just like what seven year old can say that. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's sick. Uh, um, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, that sorry. I was I was trying to pick back up from uh, where I was, but. 
But I feel like it, I'm giving like a very rambly answer now. No, you're good. But even so. still, off off of the ramble, I mean, right there. So you have these these two different, or at least a lot of different influence there, because like you probably then, I'm assuming, if you're listening to bits of the Sire or Electra Electrica catalog, you're hearing heavy music. You're hearing also then the the kind of British psych that's coming through at that point, and then you're getting all this folk stuff. So you're getting a history. You're, yeah. You're getting a degree. You're passing. And I, well, so I, I think what I really wanted to do after that, like once I started, um, you know, like learning how to play guitar and learning how to play bass and all that stuff, you know, writing like very basic, like formulaic songs. Um, I also really got into music journalism. Um, and, you know, I had a bunch of subscriptions to like every music mag. Like I still have like, 15 years worth of like spin magazine from a certain period. Um, and I got into a lot of bands like in high school, you know, when I kind of got sick of listening to all the other shit that high schoolers listen to, like yeah. <laughs> Nirvana, Green Day, Ramones, yeah. Sublime, whoever, like whatever t-shirt all like ninth yep. graders are wearing, you know? Yeah. Uh, and great news. It's the same shirts. We can confirm <laughs> to this yeah. day. They're Titans. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Like they're, those shirts are never going anywhere. There's always going to be someone buying them, which is great, you know, and yeah. it's good to have like those like gateway bands for cool. sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, eventually you want to branch out. And so like a lot of those music mags um, really kind of got me into like, you know, quote unquote, cooler stuff uh-huh. like Sonic Youth, Slow Dive. I was listening to Ride, Elliot Smith, you know, like like those magazines got me into so much music uh-huh. that like people still listen to. And this was like, you know, a, a long time ago. You know, yeah. Like, like so years ago. So you in 1994 or 95 had been aware of So Blocky, if I'm getting that right. No, no, no. So okay. sorry, I'm I'm fast yeah. forwarding a little bit. So now, <laughs> okay, goodness. School. So I was about to be like, whoa. <laughs> no, no, no. That would be crazy. That's <laughs> that would that would blow my mind if I was like, you know, five years old. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! No, one thing as just a side tangent, like I've seen a bit of research into the So Vlocky kind of ad campaign. They were SBK was sending that band to die in the U.S. That ba- like that was straight up set to flop and that's why the tape is never really available there's very little american copies until a reissue they they had no clue what to do with that band and yeah, that's interesting. to see him kind of become you know a major influence there and that or like be kind of re-appreciated very unique yeah for sure and they're still amazing live like i saw them a few years ago oh really that's sick they're really really crazy live <laughs> so when did you start like playing music and stuff um, so I started playing, um, you know, I had like a couple high school bands, uh-huh. um, you know, like most people do and, you know, really bad, uh, like around the tail end of high school, it, you know, everyone was still playing like that really awful, like metal core stuff, you know, oh, yeah. this would have, this would have been like 2000, 2008, 2009. So doing the crab uh, walk and stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah. You knew, you know, man, That's, uh, <laughs> all, all that stuff. So it's definitely, you know, a, a, a soft spot in my heart, so to speak, but, um, once, once you got done with that, um, then, you know, it kind of, I, I started writing like some folkier stuff for a little bit, mm-hmm. lots of like open tunings, um, you know, probably very much, you know, Elliot Smith or like tallest man on earth kind of stuff. Oh, um, yeah. and that was fun, you know, to like do like more like singer songwriter stuff, you know, like play shows like that and like my friend's basements and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, then like ar- around like, you know, mid twenties, I kind of, you know, all of that like heavy gaze stuff was uh-huh. happening and I had I'd been listening to a lot of slow course stuff, you know, from right around when like New Marrow group like started, you know, doing all those reissues and oh, stuff. Yeah. So I had already had the codeine box set for, you know, a long, long time uh-huh. at that point and had kind of, you know, listened to it over and over again. Um so, you know, me and a couple of my friends, we started, you know, sending demos to each other. Um that would become like the early husband stuff. Uh-huh. Um you know, spend a lot of time just like collectively, like listening to what we wanted our influences to be Uh um, for the first few months uh, as we were writing stuff and then Uh kind of figured it out from there. Um, And so, yeah, that would have been, uh, you know, probably like mid, uh, like 2015, 2016. And then I've just, I've been doing the husband stuff since then, um, you know, when I can here and there. Yeah, that's sick. So, um, were you like playing a ton of shows, like in the early days of like husbands and whatnot? Like what was like your scene like back then when you first started? 
I mean, it was good as as now the big band was uh Horse Shimper of Love. And you know, it oh, was yeah. like one of those things where like you heard, you know, that first Horse Jumper album and everyone was like, Holy shit. Yeah. You know, it was, it was just like it was and and for us too, you know, it was really it was one of those things where it was um it was very much in line with the kind of stuff that we kind of wanted to make. So it was uh-huh. like, you know, we might as well, you know, there's clearly like an outlet here for that. There's uh-huh. clearly like bands who can like do that and, you know, have an audience and have like a real like crowd response and all uh-huh. that stuff. So, um, so, so that kind of was, was a part of it. And, you know, we had a little bit of trouble getting shows initially. Uh-huh. Um, I think just because we were loud, um, this is, so when we started, this was a six piece. Oh, wow. Um, and so it was a, it was a three guitar, like wall of wall of sound, like uh-huh. six piece kind of deal. Yeah. Um, and you know, there were usually two guitars playing actual music, but there was uh-huh. usually also one guitar probably just feeding back the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was definitely, um, it was pretty deafening and, um, oh. and uh, yeah, my, my hearing is still a little bit off after those like first, like, couple years of shows um (laughs) which is you know my own stupid fault um but yeah after that you know we kind of refined it a little bit more i think you know we leaned a little bit more into the slow core thing Uh started messing around more with like dynamics and not just you know constantly trying to be loud all the time Uh and being being loud all the time is fun you know i don't don't think anyone has any any doubt about that (laughs) Um, but it's just it's kind of nicer and it's easier to refine Uh and work things out in practice when you know you can really figure out um, like a true like interplay with musicians, which uh-huh. is what is kind of so cool about slowcore because there really is like there's a timing involved that's very specific for each instrument um, that I really like. That that's personally why I like the genre. Yeah, yeah, that's sick. Uh, were you guys like playing shows at all with like any of like the exploding and sound bands that are on like the East Coast and whatnot? Were you going to like any of those shows? Was that like part of like your guys' scene at the time? So we did. Um, that, that would have come a little bit later. Oh, um, I see. But I, uh, yeah, so when we did our, our third album, and I think we had actually played with them before um, a couple times at a place that isn't doing shows anymore called Charlie's Kitchen. Uh. Um, and so so Pet Fox was, was a band that we played with now a few different times. Aren't they still um, a thing, right? Yeah, I they, they are. are yeah, I, yeah. I think they're still on Exploding in Sound, right? They yeah. have been for a minute. Uh-huh. Um, but they're they're a great band um and yeah we played with them now i think like three or four times um and yeah we played with them for what was kind of like our unofficial album release show for uh-huh. our third album um and they're just super sweet guys amazing cool. musicians um if anyone's ever seen them live they they always bring it um so yeah that's that's definitely a band that we we've gotten to play with a few times that's awesome yeah. Um, so yeah, I remember I initially found you guys like with like Joyless Youth like back in the day, like another like label that I feel like was like kind of like before the time of like slowcore and everything. You know what I mean? Like I feel like it wasn't as big as it is now when they were like doing it, which is like kind of sick. Um, and it just seemed like so like niche back like when they were doing it. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I found you guys like back then. It's sick that you guys are like still playing and stuff. Do you guys like have anything new coming out? Uh, We are working on, uh, because we had an album come out, you know, in the last few months, Mm -hmm. um, I I think we definitely have the material to do a new album this year. Um, That may or may not happen. Uh, Mm -hmm. What I really want to do this year, um, we have a couple, well, actually, it's like a a handful of bands at this point Mm -hmm. um, who we are going to try to do splits with and basically just do like a a new split um, with a different band like every like season or so. Dude, um, that's you know, cool. that way you're kind of like, it, it's a good way to like, you know, remind people you exist, but not have to like go nuts, you know, for like years yeah. making an album, you know, which yeah. like we've done that multiple times now. Um, it'd be nice to kind of like take a break from mm-hmm. that. And like, you know, you still have like 20 or so songs that you're proud of, but now you can just kind of like release them in a way where, you know, hopefully people won't get sick of them, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. You know, I think sure. it'll be fun. And so you're going to release some, oh, sorry, go. What were you saying, Maddie? I just have to say that's one of the most sensible approaches I've seen in a hot second because I don't know. I mean, I get certain artists and experimental scene that do repeatedly push out different stuff. You don't get that with this kind of music, but I think that meticulousness of, okay, we'll curate this for a season and we'll curate it with this band on a split uh-huh. is really unique and very thoughtful. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that'll be sick. Um, okay, so I guess um why did you guys like go why did you like decide to like start candle pin? Um I feel like one day you guys kind of just like came up out of nowhere and I was like, Oh, this is dope. Yeah. You know what I Again, mean? Again, like, just showed it for me as well. It just showed up out of nowhere. So yeah. And I was like, this is cool. I saw prove us wrong. Prove us that there is a context. <laughs> I saw the homies uh in like poorly drawn house and like foreign bronze and stuff on a comp. And I was like, all right, here we go. Something sick, something sick's coming out of this. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, like, you know, when, when did you get the idea to start this? Like, was this something you wanted to do for a long time? So this is, this is very much something where, you know, I think I, I probably would have started it at some point if it wasn't for the pandemic, uh -huh. but this is definitely brought about by the pandemic. Okay, for sure. Um, like I, I was on furlough from work. Uh, this probably would have been for like close to like two months at that point. This mm -hmm. was like early May 2020. Yeah. Um, and I, I was buying a lot of tapes. You know, that's like kind of where I started getting into, you know, buying tapes of like contemporary mm -hmm. bands. And um, it was it was good because you could support the bands, you know, through mostly Bandcamp. Obviously, uh -huh. you could support the bands who are all hurting from not being able to play shows and touring or like even like record in a lot of cases. Yeah. Um, but you didn't have to break the bank because oh, yeah, obviously sure. like, you know, I was on furlough. I didn't know where the money was coming from forever, you yeah. know, to begin with or yeah. how long this whole thing was going to last. So uh -huh. like, I'm, I'm trying to support and still kind of pinch pennies wherever I can. Uh -huh. Um, and you know, you don't have to break the bank. Like if you're buying like vinyl records, uh -huh. you know, all Tw the time. like 25 bucks a pop type deal, you're spending like 10, half the price yeah. on a cassette. You know what I mean? You buy Which two I did for years, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and I have, I have a decade's worth of records in a, in yeah. a room, you know, mm -hmm. but it's just like, that's, I, I can't do it all the time. Yeah. Um, I feel you. And so, so tapes just seem like a more affordable way to kind of support. And then, um, you know, my girlfriend suggested that I, you know, start my own label and, mm -hmm. you know, like a lot of places were, you know, doing charities to like different causes and, you know, yeah. should always be, but there was a lot of that going on then too. So it was mm -hmm. like, why don't we reach out to our favorite bands? A lot of those original people and bands that we reached out to probably would have been like joyless youth bands, mm -hmm. um, like a lot of, you know, local bands from Boston that mm -hmm. we would have played with yeah. or like bands that we were friends with on social media. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really, it just boiled down to me reaching out to everybody mm -hmm. on Instagram and being like, Hey, do you want to be part of a comp? This is what the proceeds are going to go to. Let me know if you can do it. There's no real deadline let's like, we'll make something cool happen if you can and yeah. we'll figure it out. Um, and so it, it was really just that. And then I think trying to take it into a, into a place where we were working with individual bands on their releases. Uh -huh. I mean, stalled was, you know, their CPR 002 for a reason. They reached out to us after um, being on that first comp and uh -huh. they, you know, they were like, we would like you to put this out. What do you think? I said, of course, like, you know, you guys rule. Like it was, it was an easy question. And then yeah. really after that, I mean, we just kept the submissions open and people kept, you know, sending submissions and they were, they all happened to be good. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really dope. I feel like you guys kind of like, you know, at the time, like picked up kind of like where, where joyless youth, like left off, you know what I mean? Like you had like stalled on there, you know? And that was like, what was that? Like, what was their other band? It was like, uh, sci-fi sleep cycles yeah exactly so uh, like and, and that project is great i definitely encourage yeah. anyone who likes stall to go back and listen to what's basically their old stuff yeah and it's like so good and then yeah you like come along and like you like put out i guess you know the remaining like uh joyless youth bands that are like still around plus like the newer stuff too i don't know it's cool um so after you put out that initial comp or just like even before the initial comp, did you have like an ethos or like an aesthetic you were going for? Or was it kind of just like, like, let's just do this comp and see where it goes? I mean, I think there, there is definitely, there's a process and there's kind of like a thinking and logic behind how either we do certain releases okay. or how we do certain things. Um, but where I'm basically at is kind of, essentially running a small label as if it's a big label. So, yeah. you know, having certain things delegated to, you know, either myself or other team members where it's like, you constantly feel the cogs kind of moving and like, mm -hmm. 
there's a there's a production sense to something there's like a there's like a almost like a conveyor belt sense where you know like okay this is done this goes on to this person this is done you know let's bring it to like submissions or pr or whatever so it's it's one of those things where it's kind of um you know i really just have it i want it to be very you know harmonious yeah <laughs> and just like very easy and smooth yeah. like between all the moving pieces that's um, sick. but also it, it's just um I, I really want it to be artist centric i really want it to be artist forward mm-hmm. um you know i think it's important that there is a label that is you know kind of helping people get their art into the world i mean any of them could obviously do it without us but it's it's a lot easier when you have a platform like a label when you have yeah. you know essentially a cheerleader in your corner uh-huh. like yeah. a lot of things would love a cheerleader in their corner uh-huh. and i mean i know i'm the same way so it's like i think that can go such a long way in terms of like word of mouth getting uh-huh. you shows in cities like you've never been to before you yeah. know just like getting your like spotify streams up and stuff uh-huh. like that so it's like just having the extra person i think can go a long way uh-huh. um so I, I think you know that's something we want to always really be cognizant of is that like we we are kind of here to try to assist bands when they need it and yeah. just hopefully work together to like get something that they feel good about that like looks professional and sounds professional and just like can really get out there and get them some more exposure it's also really cool because like you're you're able to still hold on to that like like diy values you know what i mean that like we all like grew up with and stuff um and like i saw a post that you had like recently made where it's like um i guess like people are hitting you up as if you are like a major label trying to like change like processes and stuff like that it's like it's interesting because i feel like some people forget that like they just see an entity on the internet and they think that like you know they could just like and tell it, it all so much smaller. They can give it, it like commands. Yeah. Like I get like people like with TBD, like telling me like, like just DMing me, like cold DMing me like random stuff. And I'm like, I'm just one guy, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I'm just one person. So I guess like, how do you like, uh, how do you like balance that? Like you come off like professional and obviously it's like really sick. Um, and it's like really good for the bands and just like, yeah, to have something like an actual platform, but like, how do you balance like being DIY and stuff too? you have to put on a face, you know, and yeah. it's like one of those things where you have to like, I, I don't even like if I'm, if I see that I'm getting like a bunch of like emails or like uh-huh. texts or something like regarding the label, I always want to answer stuff as soon as possible, but it's like, you've got to be in the right mood to do it. Yeah. You know, like what I do at like a day job, it's like, uh-huh. if something's bothering you, like you got to leave it at the door. So oh, it's yeah. like, I don't even want to like, you know, like sometimes like the responses, like I can definitely, it's not even being scatterbrained. It probably uh-huh. looks like scatterbrained from the outside in, but it's like, I don't want to even like look at the CPR stuff until I know that like I'm sitting down in front of my desk and like, I have the time to devote to it. Yeah. You know, and I think that that has helped me a lot in terms of, you know, getting back to everybody, uh-huh. hopefully being easy and smooth to work with, you know, hopefully everyone would uh-huh. say that, but, um, you know, I, I think it's just one of those things where like, I don't even want to talk about it until I can give you my full attention to it. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of the same thing with, you know, either my job or even like the husband stuff. It's like, I can't even pick this up and look at it until I can like sit in front of it and like spend some time with it um, and figure things out, you know? I guess that's like also important in terms of just like keeping it a hobby too. You know what I mean? Like you don't want to get like super burnt on it too. Um, yeah. What a good approach to a serious leisure yeah. activity. I get it. I do have a question regarding some of the business stuff, because again, a lot of this is just cassette releases and a lot of it has been really only regulated to Bandcamp. I'm curious if in any capacity, especially with one of the bands you have in Bristol, if you have tried to get distribution at any kind of record shop on the East Coast, anywhere kind of sent outwards to across the pond. If that seems like something that, you know, Candle Pink could do at this point. I definitely think um, that is something that we could look at um, because, you know, it's not it's not a ton of vendors, but with most of the releases at this point, um, we do definitely have like we offer wholesale prices if people want to buy a release in bulk. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, like all, like a lot of labels will do that. Typically, they're they're not charged to what the cost of manufacturing is. They usually get a discount on top of that. Uh Um, and it, you know, it brings in like a little bit, a little bit of like extra money here and there, but I wouldn't say it's enough to like, 
quite justify making X amount more copies uh-huh. just to do that. Yeah, um, I, I would be interested in it. I'm sure, you know, more importantly, the, the bands would love to get more copies made, get it overseas, you know, uh-huh. with without question, um, you know, whether that involved, you know, having like, like a partner or not, um, you know, and we did, um, you know, we, we did broach the idea of, um, you know, like for that swell release, um, we did broach the idea of, of trying to reach out to other labels um, there that could maybe make it like a joint release. Um, but when it came down to it, like crunch time, like none of them really could meet the deadlines that we had. And it, it, it just made more sense to put it out myself. And, and I'm kind of glad we did just because like, I love that band, you know, I love working with that band and their sound is great. And I feel like they're right in line with like what we're trying to do in general. That's I it. definitely feel you there on that spot. I had talked with another label, the guy who's running Island House um, down in New York, and that's a completely different sound from what Candlepin's doing. It's much more Americana, much more open rural folk. It has, it has. I mean, there is a regionality to it, but it's also not heavy music like this. This is kind of more esoteric in that fashion. And as a result, he's been able to get that put around the world and yet still... I keep thinking about like the fact that there's so many great little regional quirks to the candle pin sound that's been slowly getting developed. And with the open curation that you're talking about here, have you kind of been paying attention to that? Have you been feeling that as well? And is that definitely kind of shifting like what takes priority in release or what demos you're more interested or enticed by? So that's actually a really great question. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, we are always just trying to put out good music. Like, I don't think there was ever, and I, you know, I think I've, I've said something different in other interviews that like made it came up as like, you know, I wanted to strictly make like a slow core label, which is not the case at all. It, that is very true. Cause you, yeah. you also have like the film soundtrack, if I recall, <laughs> one of the first releases. So <laughs> yep. there's more to this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, and, and, and I think what I was trying to say initially was that like, I always appreciate like, if, if someone thinks that, you know, we're kind of like the next tier up to like what, like the Numero group stuff is doing, like, like they put a big focus on a niche genre, like slow core. Uh Um, and you know, I think we're doing that too. I wouldn't say on purpose though. Like we're, we're not opposed to putting out any genre. If I get it and I listen to it and it sounds like it's good and then, you know, it, it gets through the rest of the submissions process and everyone else likes it, it's like, we'll, we'll put it out. Uh-huh. You know, we have stuff coming out soon that is like um, a little bit more on like the freak folk side. We have oh, we have like stuff coming out that's like very like early 90s, almost like like gin blossoms type stuff. Like nice. we, we have we have some stuff coming out that I think will surprise people who are just looking for like the new like sh- you know diy like shoegaze uh-huh. or slow core album um yeah that's all i'm gonna say just in that regards but but yes um we do we want to branch out as much as possible i would love to put out like you know like if a good like hip-hop album came across our desk and it's and it's great like i want to put it out like like we start putting out a bunch of ambient albums like i want to put that out you know so i think that'd be sick really just it's as long as it's good and as long as it resonates i mean like yeah, a lot of the time sure. when I'm listening to a submission, like I'll start smiling halfway through, and I'm like, we like in my head, I'm like, we have to put this out. Uh-huh. Like, I need to email this band back right now because, like, uh-huh. like we have to be the ones like, that help them. With this, yeah, you know? but, yeah. So, um, I guess, like, how are you staying on top of the scene? Like, I feel like you guys are like kind of just staying on top of like all the new bands. Like, how do you keep up? I feel like sometimes it's hard. Like, I even sometimes have trouble keeping up with just the California, like regional scene, you know what I mean? Oh, it's, it's definitely not easy. I mean, there's a, I guess it's one of those things where like the stuff that you're interested in, you're going to constantly be doing something Uh with it. Um, it's like, it's almost in, in a, in a sense, I've, I've kind of tried to set up my days or at least like days off where it's like, I'm I'm always doing something that kind of comes back around and like finishes like a little piece of something else. You know, it's like if I can like sit down and get like a little piece done with like a song, then like move on to something else and like, you know, pack up a bunch of tapes, ship out something, listen to demos or whatever. Yeah. Um, 
and just like always kind of constantly be like moving and like finding new musicians through you know Bandcamp, Instagram. Uh-huh. I mean, that's basically like that's what the label is done through. You know, it's done through those two formats. Uh-huh. Um, and it's you know between that and just like streaming new music. Um, you know, Spotify is obviously the, the devil, but you know and trying to listen to more title and more things on Bandcamp when they come out, like, especially if I'm already like buying the tape. Yeah. Um, so, um, where was I going with this? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so it's one of those things where, um, you know, I'm always kind of just digging around and looking uh-huh. for new bands. And, you know, we have, a, we have a lot of connections to through husbands, like, uh-huh. you know, bands that we've played with, um yeah. you know, places yeah. that we're that we're looking at in terms of playing hopefully soon uh-huh. um and just you know like obviously other bands through the labels and then um you know so many i think the thing is too like another like runoff of the pandemic in general is that like all of these <laughs> these diy bands and labels kind of started springing up and now uh-huh. like we're literally for the last few years we're we're basically in like a golden age of diy you know it's almost like rivaling kind of like that early like mid mid eight you know mid eighties stuff like all of that like, really early like lo fi stuff like yeah. I I feel like it's kind of coming back around to that sort of feel again to the point where like you know you're only gonna see more people like getting talked to about it and uh-huh. you know like I'm at a point almost where I want to like you know interview people on the label and like make it into a book you know it would almost be like yeah. a modern like our band could be your life kind of thing like I feel yeah. like that would be sick. Cause like a lot of people are invested in what these bands have to say right now. Like that's why people yeah. are going to Philadelphia to go to Julia's war. For, for sure. Five days. Yeah. Yeah. Like this is, this is a scene. Like this is like a big deal thing happening that like, like people will care to read about in like 20 years easily. Like no questions asked. That's actually pretty crazy that you like bring that up. Cause like, it is true. You know what I mean? I just have never thought about it that way, but it's like, yeah, we do actually kind of live in like a crazy time right now. Like DIY is really popping off. What were you going to say? If, you, I think about it every day, yeah. honestly. <laughs> if you know the labels and stuff, cause again, it's, I almost ignore a lot of the hardcore happenings. Um, it's just not the realm that I always kind of gun to, but yes, it, when you actually take a look at the bigger picture, it's so blatantly obvious that all of this stuff has like sprung up uh-huh. and is just kind of going. Yeah. Um, one thing I did want to ask, cause you had brought it up with connections to different venues or stuff you're playing favorite venues that husbands has been at favorite random regional markets or places that you're like, Oh, we got to get back to what, what excites you out there on the road? Uh, I mean, unfortunately we, we are trying to, uh, to do more, just like playing outside of Boston, um, uh-huh. especially this this spring and summer. Come to California. Um, but, we got a spot for you. Oh man, I would love to. If if I can get if I can convince everyone else to get out there, like we would definitely I, I would do it in a heartbeat. I mean I would take like PTO off to do that. Yeah, right. No questions <laughs> asked. Like of course. Um so yeah, I mean if, if there's ever a date or something, you know, feel free to pitch it. It'll probably be a long shot. But I mean I am trying to get out to uh Cali soon to to go visit some friends out there and hopefully stay for like a week. So that maybe sick, we can dude. like build something around that. <laughs> That'd be cool, dude. Um, Hell yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we're always, we're always, it's always worth asking, you know, that's what I've learned. Um, in, in terms of other places, like we recently played a spot in, uh, in Providence called the parlor. That was really cool. Oh. Um, and that, that was probably like one of our like best turnouts ever. Um, just like really great show, really great energy and atmosphere. And that's awesome. um, that was with Pulsar and they're, they're a great band uh-huh. and, and oh, yeah. um, it was a good lineup. It was a really good time. Um, that's and it. then, yeah, our, uh, we, we had, we had some really great, uh, release shows. Um, one was at a house venue in Alston, Mass. And that was with uh, Nixie Nix, Bad History Month, and Pet Fox. Oh wow, that's sick! And yeah, that was in a basement with like you know a t- ton of people. That was that was a really fun show. Um, and then the one that we did for the last album was at the Lily Pad, and we and we like playing there a lot too. Uh-huh. Um, and that was with Trust Blinks, um, and just like being able to play with somebody from the label is is always fun, you know, especially when like Trust Blinks came from like la to be out in boston yeah, yeah like, i was like gonna say aren't they from la that's crazy yeah. yeah i i think i think originally like without like speaking too much for him or like his own backstory i think ethan is from 
somewhere in mass like to some okay. extent like maybe he like grew up here or something uh-huh. but um yeah he's a really sweet guy like can't can't speak highly enough about about him at all he's actually been emailing me for a radio show date i have to get back to uh him on that so maybe we'll have uh them on the show soon I, that would be really cool i would definitely try to tune in yeah. something i guess i do find a little interesting from this conversation is again though and we've we've had this actually um when we talked with um Matt and Jen, Jennifer, Jennifer uh Powers there and Matthew Rowland. Mm-hmm. Um the re so again, you have this point where the barriers to getting your music out could not be lower. Any again, band in LA, you can hear in Massachusetts, but getting them to come out on different coasts, it's become the sounds are becoming, or at least the touring patterns are very regionally landlocked mm-hmm. almost. And it's just a completely it, it is a completely this is the thing that I guess like the maybe not the downside, but the strange double edged sword of this moment. The costs compared to the 80s are not there to make the full scale get in the van kind of 50 state or, you know, or outside of a certain region. But the sounds are there uh-huh. and everybody's doing little stuff in their own pockets. Yeah. I'm just thinking. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I do think, I mean, that is, those are all great points. Um, the one thing I would say, though, is that I feel like, you know, especially with music, um, the benefit of hindsight is is really big, you know, and like some of the stuff that maybe, you know, especially with, you know, almost like a, like oversaturating of like these bands coming out, like it is hard to like sit down and listen to like every single thing that comes out. It is hard, you know, even if you're like reviewing music to like sit down and listen to like 15 bands that sound like Alex G, you know, like, yeah, <laughs> it is hard to like to to, to kind of like sift through that stuff and get to the stuff that you really like and you really care about. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I think that the stuff that is coming out now, a lot of it is like it's it's gonna you know like i said it's gonna get rediscovered in like 15 20 years like 100 it is yeah. gonna get repressed even if it's like a like something that's like on 50 copies on a cassette tape yeah someone's gonna put that on vinyl in like five years you know like if, if it isn't if it isn't me it's gonna be somebody else and like there's always gonna be an audience for people coming back around to these like smaller kind of like almost like more like niche bands and scenes but um I, you know i i do think there is enough popping up out of you know what like really the entire region at least i can't speak for every country but like with the states it's like i would love to put out an album by like band from each state you know because i feel like at this point we've almost gotten submissions from like enough of that stuff yeah, I mean, yeah you know you, you hear some regional similarities and like you hear maybe some stuff that's like you know this is a little bit more of what you would expect from like a band in like a big city versus uh-huh. like something in like you know a, a state with like less like population uh-huh. density um but like you're you're really seeing kind of all of these little bubbles pop up really all over the place in yeah. every state and it's it's really interesting to see um so i think like you're always just going to have that carryover and that spillover um you know just you'll see bands kind of influencing each other and i think they are still getting in the van they are networking and like you know in some cases maybe spending all of their money to do these things um but you can do so much with like being good at social media and even going on like a four day tour, you oh, know, for like, sure. yeah, you can yeah. do a lot with that in terms uh-huh. of exposure and turning that into something that like really takes your band to the next level. Uh-huh. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I guess one more thing before we, we head on out to a, a listener question or two. Um, so I wanted to ask you why primarily cassette and do you have any plans for like other formats or anything? Um, we are definitely, we always off, offer the CD stuff. Um, some bands want it, some bands don't. And, you know, we always want to figure out which format they want more. Mm-hmm. Um, we've also had like, you know, some CDs sit there and then others like fly out. So it's like, it, it's kind of hard to determine like which way that's going to go. But mm-hmm. um, the cassettes just because they're easier to, and cheaper to manufacture and because there is still like an audience for them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there are still people getting into every like, you like the people with the joyless youth catalogs and the disposable America catalogs. Yep. Um, you know, there are people who are always going to be around to buy that stuff. Um, we do definitely want to do vinyl at some point. It's really just, it's a lot of different factors for one. You have to know that you're working with a band that can guarantee to sell yeah, somewhere so, um, around like a hundred copies for like uh-huh. $2,000. 
And like, that's a lot. Like that's like yeah. a minimum for like most like pressing plants. And then you have to wait upwards of a year to get uh-huh. a product in people's hands. Like that just yeah. doesn't sound fun for me from really any angle. Um, but I know that it means a lot to like certain people, you know? So it's like, we do want to offer it at some point. Um, it's just one of those things that is like probably a little bit out of our reach right now in terms of like, yeah, what we can put into it financially and what we can expect to get out of it financially. So how and then does- again, yeah, finding like the plant and building that relationship. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say too, like, how do you, how do you, um, I guess make your money to keep the label going. Like, so are you just like giving all of the product to like the band or something? And then like, they're making all of the profit or is it kind of like, yeah, you try to put it on Bandcamp for yourself too. And like try and keep a portion. Well, so, so the Bandcamp stuff through the label, we get none of that money. That all goes basically to Bandcamp, which like at some Mm -hmm. point, hopefully soon, we're going to try to like, actually like get like a real website built out. Uh um, And just like, you know, and try to get some of that money back yeah and just not be in band camp you know be like a little bit more professional yeah kind of like the next step you know uh-huh. a little bit more uh reputable so it's um it's one of those things we are looking at um but in terms of like how we usually go about with the physicals um we don't ask for any money from the bands up front for physicals um because we are taking money back um from the purchases at uh-huh. least the pre-orders um, we always want to make sure that we are getting um, some copies of physicals into the band's hands so they can mm-hmm. either sell it themselves through tours, shows, uh, through their own band camp or their own website. Um, we always just want to make sure that they're getting that back. And then we can also set up something if they want to do a percentage. Mm-hmm. Um, we've done percentages with bands too. If they want cool. us to like kick back the um, kick back like a split between like the pre-order cost we can do that too um we've never done like any sort of like you know hard and fast contract but we always offer it we can definitely like have one written up but Uh i mean for the most part i think like really we're really easy to work with Uh a lot of the money does get funneled back into the next release and then some of it like if we want to do a bigger project that will require a little bit more manpower in terms of like shirt design Uh or um, you know, like getting like shirts made or something like that. Um, then, you know, you figure out a different way to kind of split the profits and like figure out what you need to keep versus what needs to go back in. Yeah. Um, but at this point, I feel like we're almost putting out so many releases that it's like, you know, it is basically just like every single thing that comes out, like basically funds the next thing. Uh-huh. So, um, that's kind of interesting. And, and you know, that's worked well, especially for something that I can't devote, like, literally all of my time to at least not yet like it's it's one of those things where um it does make it a little bit more manageable and you don't kind of have to think about the next step as much but hell yeah that's sick okay so we do have a couple listener questions are you ready to take those sure okay cool um so this first one says what's the what's the goat boston slang what's the what What's the goat Boston slang? I'm assuming it means like, what's like the best Boston slang right now or something. I don't know if there is any right now. I feel like, I feel like that's a very, unfortunately, I feel like that is like, like no one really walks around saying like wicked pissa anymore. You know, like (laughs) I feel like that when I was a little kid growing up here, like people did talk like that. So yeah, I guess. That's so funny. Yeah, I guess, I guess this person was so ready for like, coach. oh boy, it's a Boston label. We got to <laughs> ask the question. <laughs> and then I know, right? I mean, it's funny because like, with a heavy heart that nope. <laughs> you don't even have the New England accent where you say like, you know, your your R's sound like an A type deal. Um, I know I get that all the time. I was just, I don't know. I went to like a really good high school and I grew up in Arizona and yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, <laughs> I've read a lot. Is, yeah. I, think that, I think that kind of kept the, the the accent out of my mouth a little bit, yeah. um, but you know, it, it comes out a little bit. I'm like, you know, a big like Celtics fan. So, um, you know, sometimes, you know, the accent comes out a little bit of them like screaming at the TV, but yeah. you know, besides that, I think it's pretty, <laughs> pretty know, much kept to itself. <laughs> my dad's from Texas and the accent shows up. In fact, my my uncle's visiting right now. And so the accent is there. It comes back. Yeah. It just, but then he'll leave and we're back. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's sick, dude. <laughs> so I like, I like seeing that. I like hearing that certain quirks make it happen. <laughs> uh, so this next one says, uh, when, when's the toe show? When's the what? The toe show. Toe show. I don't know. 
You know, I wouldn't I wouldn't even be surprised if that's from uh, our guitarist, Pat. That sounds like something he would say. Um, <laughs> Can you I know you can't tell me who it's from. Um, says, but Oh, yeah. Pat Kenny. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, he's, Pat's he's got a goofball, but uh, he he is my foil in the band, so I, I do love that about it. <laughs> All right, well, man. shout out Pat, dude. Yeah. Okay, so this next one says, "Oh, you want to take this one, Maddie?" I guess I could go for it. Um, looking for favorite of the Numero reissues and the biggest hope of yours to see reissued. Um, so I would say yes, they need to make more of the bedhead. Uh, box set because I think that's sold out. Yeah, um, the CD's available still. That's all I know. I don't need that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, um, in terms of what I would like to see them do, I'm a big uh, Seam fan, and oh, I feel like yeah. they have not had physicals of that band in like a very long time. Yeah, well, this is just coming from my own imagination, right? That's what yeah. we need. That's what yeah. we're yeah. looking okay. for. Um, I would like them to do one band. I'll, I'll try to keep it to one band. One band that I was listening to recently that I always come back to. I would just like to see them, um, see Matador reissue the, uh, Chavez records. Dude, like Chavez is so sick. I just found out about oh, that band recently. is great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're so I mean, good. I, I like, uh, I've got one of the EPs over there. When Thomas and I were at the record shop last month. You saw me grab that EP Thomas for three bucks. Yeah. I found like a, <laughs> like a what's up Matador comp um like a cd comp a while back and i bought it because it was like three bucks and chavez was probably like one of the bands that stuck out to me most and that's how i found them just on this random old matador comp um yeah yeah that's amazing dude chavez is so sick that would be super cool if they got like some some reissue hype yeah i would i would love to like just dig through like a chavez like box set with like all the photos and like line oh, yeah. and stuff like that like i feel like i would i would pay like a 100 bucks or whatever that would be oh like, for easy. sure yeah you guys know that the guitarist of Chavez, Matt Sweeney, he was Andrew WK's manager for a couple years. Really? Yep, up Didn't to like the that. start of I Get Wet. He that shows is up so random. Book. Great band. Also <laughs> love, uh, big shout out to the first Super Bowl and the second one. So my favorite stuff there. Mm. Well, um, yeah, anyways, I guess we'll wrap that up. I guess that just does it for all of our, our listener questions here. Um where can people keep up with all things like Candlepin and whatnot? Um, so Candlepin Records dot um, Obviously, Instagram Candlepin underscore Records on there. Um, I think it's just same thing on Twitter Candlepin underscore Records. And um, we are hopefully, like I said, I think next step is kind of getting a website together, and then with that would be like a full on like email newsletter. You know, mm-hmm. just something like a little bit easier something easier for listeners to keep up with and just like more professional looking. Uh-huh. Um, so I want to yeah. see if we can do that like within like the next like month or two That'd be sick. Um, and just make it easier for people to keep track of us. Um, and yeah, you know, just keep up with any of our, not our bands, but any of the amazing bands on our roster. Um, Cause a lot of them were kind of at a point where like, we're potentially looking into doing, you know, like new releases with uh-huh. bands that we've already released with and I'm kind of working towards having like, a real artist roster that like feels like very solid. So hopefully, you know, that stuff will be coming down the pipeline and yeah, just always working on new stuff. And we can uh, look forward to a, a candle pin fest coming up soon. Um, it will be the, the Boston version of Julia's war fest. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, we are. We are definitely talking about that. Um, interestingly enough though, um, you know, because we have so many uh, New York bands, and New York just has more labels that would be a little bit more receptive to it. Uh-huh. Um, if we do a candle pin fest, it will 90% probably be in New York city. Dude, um, I would go out there for that. We, we are looking at venues for it right now. Again, like same thing with like the, um, the, the new comp with Julia's war, no ETA on it, but hopefully sooner rather than later. Yeah, so we're looking into options for that right now. Dude, that's so oh. sick. Boston's <laughs> gonna take over. Dang, Boston's gonna. Boston's taking over New York. <laughs> but even though it's a bunch of New York bands. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh you my forgot. God! I forgot the question, Aiden. We're not <laughs> done yet. I'm sorry. We're not done. No. Okay. So, you want me to take it, Maddie? Thomas, I'll go. I'll go for it. Okay, okay. Yeah. Take it. Take it. All right, Aiden. You. You know. You just put in your order from. I'm assuming you do tapes from Duplication CA or 
Yep. Just get your next uh, Candlepin 27th release in. Get a you know big box of tapes. You're really excited to take the photo and you know get the Bandcamp listing up. But fortunately, Duplication CA was having a big oopsie, and they had a little rat infestation, and a white lab rat ended up in the box. And when you open it up, the rat's all scared and and jumps. It's going to jump in your mouth. But you have a decision here: head first or butt first, and why? Oh man, it's the hardest question of the show, dude. <laughs> Um, I mean, I guess I'd probably have like face first, right? Because like I don't know, like like a like a dirty pigeon like flew in my face once when I was walking down the street, and like that's right. You know, it was like the pigeon's face was like in my eyes, but like not its ass. So, you know, <laughs> but you know, sorry, <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I, I guess I guess I would rather have it go uh, face first. <laughs> yeah, that's a good answer. You have some personal yeah, right? experience with the pigeon. I can see where it came from. I love this question because we always get a different answer. We've never had somebody with like a, a personal, ex- like traumatic experience before. Um, yeah, that's we are a, so sorry to have reignited that. Yeah, fire. I'm sorry to uh, bring up past traumas, dude. Um, TBD also pigeon therapy. Um, anyways. That's all we have for today. Thanks for tuning in to TBD on KCS BFM 91.9 every Sunday, 4 to 6 p.m. and NetNet Radio every Wednesday, 7 p.m. This has been Aiden from Husbands and Candlepin. Thanks so much, dude. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a blast. TBD rocks. <laughs>